here we go. This is the Skip Bayless Show, episode 80, in honor of my buddy Jerry Rice, the most famous ever number 80, and also a fellow Oklahoman, Steve Larchin. He wore 80 proudly also. This, as always, is the un-undisputed everything I cannot share with you during the debate show, the discussion show that is undisputed. Boy, are we ever having fun now on Undisputed. Today, I will go deep into the life and times of one Dion Sanders. Today, I will answer many of your questions, including some concerning why I didn't tweet How About Them Cowboys after Sunday night's game, 40 to nothing at Giants. Also, another question about how this Sunday night was going to be so special for me and now is so scary for me as the Jets visit the Cowboys with 435 Eastern this Sunday. And also, I will answer your question about which Cowboy jersey I'm now leaning toward purchasing for this season. I might surprise you with that one. But first up, as always, it is not to be skipped. As I just mentioned, I now want to give you my deepest thoughts on as rare a human as I have ever known, ever been around, ever studied. That man is Deion Sanders. As rare as I've ever known, and that is on and off the field of play. Long before I got to know Dion in 1995 in Dallas, Texas, I did a radio show in Dallas, station called The Ticket. Again and again, I made the case, I fought for, I pushed for, on air, Deion Sanders being the greatest athlete ever. And there were so many other candidates at the time. It was all about Bo Jackson, Bo Knows, all the Nike commercials. But my point was, Dion, even by then, had become by far the greatest cornerback ever. The gap between Dion and the next best corner, you can take your pick. You could take our guy, Richard Sherman. You could take, na- name them. There, there are so many. But the gap between Dion and the second greatest corner of all times was much greater than the gap between the best and the second best player at any other National Football League position. And then you get into the detail of how Deion Sanders was the starting center fielder for the Yankees, the Braves, the Reds, and the Giants. In 1992, while playing for the Atlanta Falcons, Deion Sanders also played for the Atlanta Braves, played 97 games, quite a big chunk of the schedule. He batted 304 that year in 97 games for the Atlanta Braves. 304, he led the National League in triples in just 97 games with 14. That fall, he played in the Fall Classic. He played in the World Series for the Braves, still playing for the Falcons, so he managed to play four of the six games of the World Series for the Braves. He went eight for 15 at the plate. That's 533 with two doubles and five stolen bases, all while making, as a Falcon that year, first team All-Pro at cornerback. It's just off the charts, incomprehensibly great. Meanwhile, little known fact, Deion Sanders was first team all state in basketball in the state of Florida. A lot of good athletes in Florida. First team all state in basketball. And Deion ran track at Florida State for a team that won the ACC Conference Championship, thanks in part to Deion running a leg of the 4x100 relay team race. You've probably heard, maybe you haven't. It's it's almost a mythological story, but very true about Dion at the NFL Combine. 
He shows up in a tracksuit, not to run, just for style and show. Somebody made an offhanded comment to Dion that he did not like, rubbed him the wrong way, set him off about why he wasn't going to run the 40-yard dash that day. He said, okay. And without stretching, Dion unzipped the top of his tracksuit and pulled off the bottoms of his tracksuit without stretching and said, let's go. Boom. Ran 4-2 in the 40. Ran 4-2. This is rare, rare, rare speed. And I look back at all of his baseball statistics and I say, how did you do that? And then you did that. And then you did that. I mean, in 1997, Dion stole 56 bases for the Reds. 1997, 56 bases just to drive home the all-around athleticism. Yet what began to take me about Dion was not since my all-time favorite athlete as a kid, Muhammad Ali, not since Ali had any athlete ever handled himself with such supreme confidence. I'd never seen anything like it since Ali. Such flair, such style, such I don't care what anybody says, I'm going to do it this way, my way. I mean, Neon Dion, as he was called in those days, invented swagger. He invented it. Ali didn't have the swagger even that Dion did. Prime time, as they also called him, high stepped into the end zone with his hand, as you know, behind his head on punt returns and kickoff returns and pick sixes. Never seen anything quite like it. Never have I ever seen an athlete just so sure of himself. He just knew when he stepped on the field or on the basketball court or on football or baseball field on on the track, he just knew he was better than anybody else there at that time. That NFL draft that year, 1989, I remember it so well because Troy Aikman went first to my Dallas Cowboys. Second was Tony Mandarich to Green Bay. Third was Barry Sanders to Detroit. Then Derek Thomas, late great, to Kansas City. Fifth was Dion to the Falcons, fifth. And I look back at this draft and I think, okay, Dallas did make the right pick in Troy. You got to have the quarterback, obviously, to go win the three Super Bowls. Tony Mandrich was a complete swing and miss. I don't know how Dion would have managed to operate in Green Bay, but I'm sure he would have figured it out. And the Packers really made a huge mistake there. Barry Sanders, obviously 10-time Pro Bowler MVP. But just me, if you made me choose between Barry Sanders and Deion Sanders, I'd take Deion. I'd take that Sanders over that Sanders. I'd take Deion over Barry. I know he was all-time great breakaway back, but they couldn't use him in short yardage or goal line because he could not run between the tackles. But as far as breakaway, escape, open field, never anything like him this side of Michael Vick. Derek Thomas was great. Stalwart. Difference maker on defense and as a pass rusher, but I'd still take Dion. That's just me. And then I throw this in. In pro football, Dion did catch 60 passes in his career, as well as returning six punts for touchdowns and three kickoffs for touchdowns. 1996 in Dallas. Deion Sanders had the second most receiving yards on that team to my man, Michael Irvin. As I'm sure you remember, in 1994, Deion's presence in San Francisco literally tilted the playing field in favor of those 49ers. He was the defensive player of the year that year, his only year in San Francisco for the 49ers. As you might recall, I do so painfully in that 94 season championship game at Candlestick, 
The 49ers bolted ahead 21 to nothing, thanks in part to a Dion interception of Troy Aikman. They hung on to win that game. They went on to annihilate the San Diego Chargers in the Super Bowl. So Dion wins the Super Bowl there, and voila, next thing I know, he's coming to Dallas. And Deion Sanders literally tilts the whole playing field back in favor of those Cowboys who went on to win the Super Bowl. Because as Barry Switzer, then coach of the Cowboys, told me after Dion's first practice, I walked off the field with Barry. Good friend of mine. Love you, Barry. Barry's seen a lot of athletes in his day. And he said, I've never seen anything like Dion. His quote to me was, it's like he's not governed by the same gravity the rest of us are. I agree with that in more ways than one. It's almost literally and figuratively almost an alien of a human as an athlete and and also as a persona. Just as a rare, rare alien of a human, if you will. Changed life for the Cowboys because Dion was so good at what he did that you could just give him one side of the field and say, You got that. I, I got that. Whoever comes over here, if you want to put him on the whoever, you could put him on the tight end, you could put him on the best wide out, you could put him on whoever. He's going to take whomever out of the game. Dion was bigger than you think. He went 6'1, about 200 pounds. He did hit, I think, look back at my stats here. As a baseball player, he had 39 home runs in his career, so he had a little bit of pop, a little bit of pop. Got criticized heavily in those days for not being able to tackle, not wanting to tackle. No. If he needed to tackle, if it was time to tackle, if he had to get somebody on the ground because the game was on the line, trust me, trust me, he tackled. 1995, again, was the first time I got to be around Dion in locker room situations. What struck me right away was how quiet he was. Such a big personality. So entertaining occasionally in interviews, but in day-to-day, no. Kept to himself, stayed away from the media, extremely low-key, a little bit distant, but in a good way because it was clear to me from the start He did not want to create a spectacle in a cowboy locker room that was star-studded. He wanted to blend in. He wanted to be a great teammate and a very important cog in a Super Bowl championship run, which he certainly was. But he just wanted to be one of the guys, and was he ever. They loved Dion. I think Dion loved being a cowboy. I think it was as much fun as he's ever had because it was such a great stage for him. He was born to be on the America's team stage. After that season, I wrote my third and final book on the Cowboys called Hell Bent. Dion did do a local sort of cable TV show in Dallas with Pam Oliver, the the great Pam Oliver. And Dion had me on the show to talk about my book and in the makeup room as I was getting a little bit of something on my face to make me look a little better than I did, Dion pulled me aside and said, look, I I read your book, did a good job, very accurate, but he said, when you come out there on stage, I'm going to grill you. I'm going to go after you. I'm going to ask you some tough questions, and did he ever, and I loved it, but he, he declared himself up front, and The beauty of that interview was that Dion knew what he was talking about. Dion did read my book. And obviously, because he lived in that locker room, he knew that I knew of what I spoke. What a year that was. What a book that was to write, hell-bent. So then it was something of a surprise to me as I went on, moved to Chicago to work for the Chicago Tribune and think of what I got to do, I went from the Dallas Cowboys of Roger Staubach, Troy Aikman, and ultimately Michael Irvin and Deion Sanders. I go to Chicago just in time for 1998 and Michael Jeffrey Jordan 
and the last dance bulls. And soon after that is three years. I went out to the Bay Area and I got Barry Bonds at his greatest, greatest hitter ever, Barry Bonds. What an education I got in the world of sports. But it was something of a surprise to me that in 1997, or shortly after that, I read a book by Dion called Power, Money, and Sex, How Success Almost Ruined My Life. And in that book, he recounted how as his first marriage was breaking up, to quote him, he said, I was pretty much on fumes. I was empty, no peace, no joy, losing hope. Money and sex had not solved any of his problems. So Dion wrote in his book that he attempted suicide. Dion Sanders attempted suicide. That was shocking to me, but grounding for me because Dion is and always was very human. He hurt and he bled like the rest of us. He was just rarer than all the rest of us. But he attempted suicide, he wrote in his book, by driving a car off a cliff. He guesstimated it was a 30 or 40 foot drop and yep, he survived it. And at that point, says Dion, I got down on my knees and I gave it all to the Lord. My faith is my everything, says Dion. And I believe him. Think what would have been lost if Dion's life had been lost in that car over the edge of that cliff 30 or 40 feet crashing below. His son Shiloh, now playing safety for his Colorado Buffaloes, would not have been born. That was three years later after this. That was February 9th of 2000. His son Shadur, now a Heisman Trophy candidate, if not in my book, the Heisman leader, I know it's early, was born two years after Shiloh, so there would have been no Shiloh and no Shadur. But God was good. And then, in a very different kind of shock to me, but a shock nonetheless, all of a sudden I'm reading that Dion is coaching. He's coaching high school football. I'm thinking, well, is it just for his kids? He's coaching private academies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay, it's just a lark. It's just something to do as he eases out of playing and into his second life. And the next thing I know, people close to Dion are telling me, no, he's very serious about coaching. And I'm thinking, no. It just doesn't happen this way. The greater the player, and this is the greatest cornerback ever, they're just above coaching because coaching is just too hard, especially at the high school or the college level. It's just too difficult. The recruiting is just too hard. It takes too much time, too much effort, too much elbow grease. You have to fly to too many places to meet too many moms and too many dads and too many kids and get down on bended knee and try to convince them to come to Jackson State? Really? Well, I loved it that he went to an HBCU school. Love that. that. That was a beautiful thing. And I'm thinking, well, that's it. He just wants to go for a few years and try to, to put historically black colleges, universities, sort of back on the map in sports. Because once upon a time, back in the 70s, 80s, the NFL pipeline flowed through those schools. All the Gramblings and the Alcorns, Florida a and I could go on and on, and obviously the Jackson States. And then one day I read, what? Dion's ready to move on. I think TCU, are they interested in him? Eh, maybe, but maybe not. But Colorado jumps. Colorado 1-11 and 11 last season jumped with both feet. 
got their boosters involved, came up with the right money to do it the right way so that Dion could bring the best coaching staff in college football to Boulder, Colorado. Right place, right time, rarest human. Wait, Dion, you, you want to try to turn around a Colorado program that, that couldn't even come close last year, that was losing to the top 25 teams by an average of 30 points a game? You, you want to try that on for size? You're too good for that. You've got your money. You've got your commercials. You, you don't need this. No, I'm told by Michael Irvin, my new teammate on my dream team on Undisputed, no, he loves coaching the kids because he loves mentoring the kids. He loves impacting their lives as well as their ability to play football. And I'm thinking, really? This is hard. Dion's 56 years of age. Does he really need this? Does he? Does he really want that? Does he want this? Uh, in awe, I have sat back watching Deion Sanders pull off the single greatest turnaround in the history of college football. I know the rules now allow this to happen much quicker than it probably ever could have had before. Although Dion, I always say, is one guy I don't bet against. I used to say this about Thomas Edward Patrick Brady Jr. But Dion is one guy I don't bet against sort of on or off the field, in football or in life. I don't bet against him. He's seeing it in ways none of us can see it. He's seeing it before it happens, and he saw Colorado before it happens. And all of a sudden, because of the transfer portal, he had to make some tough decisions. He ran off a lot of kids. Pack your bags. 86 new faces in that program, 86 new players. It's impossible. They turned it around, they got it ready, and they went to TCU and outscored the defending national runner-up at home on a national stage. They outscored Texas Christian University, the Horn Frogs. They did that. I, I was in awe, but that night I sat back and said, why should I be surprised? It's Dion. Their rival, Nebraska, comes to Boulder. I thought Nebraska was pretty good. I thought they played very hard on defense. I think they're pretty well coached on defense. It took a half. It was 13 to nothing at halftime, and then it broke open. All of a sudden, I look up, it's 36 to 7. Colorado, Travis Hunter, Shiloh, Shadur, Weaver, the receiver, little Dylan Edwards. I, I, I don't know. I see skill, superior skill everywhere. Shadur Sanders can play. You think, yeah, but he's the son of a great cornerback. Where did this come from? You want to talk about poise? You want to talk about accuracy? You want to talk about command? He was the freshman player of the year, HBCU. Then he was the national college football subdivision player of the year. His second year at Jackson State, national player of the year. Started all four years in high school. He's played a lot of football at a high level. Colorado has a chance because of a Shadur Sanders now becoming better known for his first name than his last name. He's just Shadur, not a Sanders. We, we get that. We know that. But he's, he's becoming his own man. This is arguably, early on, the greatest coaching job in the history of college football. And I know several of the coaches on his staff. It is star-studded. But the driving force is obviously the guy who used to wear number 21, who's touching all those kids' lives, who's making a difference, who has 
turned college football upside down, doing it his way. All those good old boy network coaches are shaking in their boots. How is this happening? Where did he come from? How is he doing this? It's a new dawn. It's a new age. Did you see the ratings? <laughs> a game that kicked off out here in Los Angeles last Saturday at 9 a.m., Nebraska at Colorado, outrated. This, that game was obviously on Fox. Outrated arguably the ESPN game of the year, a game I was all over, a game I could not wait for, Texas at Tuscaloosa at Alabama. The Fox game outrated the ESPN game only because of one rare human, Deion Sanders. We have had the honor and the privilege to have Dion on Undisputed each of the last two Mondays. He loves Michael Irvin like a brother. He knows Keyshawn very well. When Richard Sherman has gone through his off-field issues, Dion has been right there to counsel him, to help him, to prop him up, point him in the right direction. It seems like everywhere I turn, there's somebody who's been touched by Dion. He does so much good work off the field. His heart is in the right place. He is giving back every minute of every day. I have never, ever seen anything quite like Deion Sanders. And I can't wait for this coming Monday. And I can't wait for two weeks out. There's Colorado State this Saturday, then at Oregon, and then USC goes to Boulder. Another Fox game. I'll be there. Undisputed will be there. I can't wait. Let's get to your question, shall we? This is Jack from New York who asks, how come you didn't tweet, how about them Cowboys on Sunday after the Giants game? Jack, full disclosure, open-hearted honesty. I forgot. That's what happened. I just forgot. Please remember, new format now on the new Undisputed. I have a little more responsibility. You could argue a whole lot more responsibility than I've had before. I have to write the little leads for each of the topics as I sort of moderate and obviously engage in the discussions and debates. There's so much that goes on after a late night Cowboy game. I have to go back through the play-by-play -play and pinpoint the exact plays I need in video that I can request and it helps to do it the night before so they have time to assemble all the plays I need to fortify my arguments the following day on Monday on the show. It's, it's a lot of work. It's great work. It's the greatest work anybody could ever do, especially after they win 40 to nothing. But because they were so far ahead, certainly after three quarters, I thought, you know what? This is one night I'm not going to sleep for three hours off a night game. Let me see if I can get four and a half. So I dived in and I was watching the game with one eye as Deuce Vaughn got in and got a little bit of run late in the game. Obviously, Kevontae Turpin actually was featured far more than Kellen Moore ever featured him. Love that. But I'm watching with one eye and I'm working frantically with the other eye and my right hand scribbling, scribbling, scribbling. And because the game was so anticlimactic that I even called my producer, Tyler Korn, while the game was still going on to go over some of these plays and some thoughts for the next day. And I flat out blanked out. I just forgot. I didn't remember until maybe 
30 minutes after the game. And I thought, God, I, I didn't tweet. How about them Cowboys? Signature. It's just, I, I look forward to it more than you do probably. And I thought, should I do it now? Well, it was so far after the fact. Now it's, must have been close to midnight in the East. Uh -oh, nobody will even see it. I'm sure everybody, especially as we go East across the country, that they've gone to bed. It just didn't feel right to do it so far after the fact. It felt like it'd be out of place. So, I'm glad you asked. I'm ashamed that I didn't. But I can promise you this, Jack from New York, it will not happen again. This is Dan from Huntington, West Virginia. Is it too late to become a Cowboy fan this season? Come one, come all, Dan from Huntington. America's team has led the league in fans dating back to the 1970s. I was there in Dallas. In fact, it was my first season covering the Cowboys as the lead columnist for then Dallas Morning News. The 1978 season, which ended against those Pittsburgh Steelers of Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan and John Stallworth and Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer in that steel curtain defense featuring Mean Joe Green. It was the single greatest collection of talent on one football field I have ever seen. Dallas versus Pittsburgh in Super Bowl 13 in Miami. I was there. Cowboys lost 35 to 31. Jackie Smith, God bless him, good man. Dropped a little bunny of a touchdown pass from my guy, Roger Staubach, that could have changed that game. Just dropped it. Jackie Smith's Hall of Famer. Just, just all-time great tight end. He just dropped. It was too easy. It hung in the air. Roger took a little off it, and it hung like a blimp in the air, and Jackie could not corral it. I don't know why, but that's how close they came. And then after that season, NFL Films put out highlight films, highlight videos for each team. And that year's NFL film film about the Cowboys was called America's Team because the great John Facenda, the voice of God narrator for all these different highlight films, says in his narration during that one that this team appears on TV so much that they are as recognizable as movie stars and U.S. presidents. They are America's team, said John Facenda, and it stuck. And it stuck like a target on their backs. And shortly after that highlight film was released, I believe it was for a Sunday column I wrote for the Dallas Morning News. I called the great Drew Pearson at home, the initial original 88 Drew Pearson. Now, finally, as he should have been long ago in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, how many big catches did he make for Roger Staubach, starting with the Hail Mary, that pass, the pass? Drew was a spokesman for that team a team leader for that team, and he was livid. He was outraged over the, the title stuck on them of America's team, telling me, and I'll just paraphrase, give me a you-know-what break. We didn't ask to be called America's team. They put it on us. Now, he said, the target on our backs will get bigger and bigger. Wherever they went, everybody wanted to beat the Cowboys. The Cowboys became everybody's Super Bowl week after week after week. It got harder and harder, and through the 80s, they began to struggle as Gil Brandt, in his draft mastering, let Tom Landry down. But America's team stuck. And despite not going back to an NFC Championship game for 27 years, it still sticks. It's bigger than ever. How many fans have I encountered out in the streets or at road shows wearing cowboy jerseys? Now I would say, 
where you grew up, I'm from New York or I'm from Seattle or I'm from Chicago. How did you become a Cowboy fan? I, I don't know. It was just those jerseys, man. When I was a little kid, I would watch those jerseys and they, they just got me. The late, great Texas E. Schramm, sort of the original architect of the Cowboys, their president and general manager, told me that he actually, in picking the metallic blue color of the jerseys, had a TV camera installed in his office so that he could actually take different fabric, different shades of blue and test them on the TV camera to see how they would actually look on real TV and chose that shade of metallic blue because it was so pleasing to the eyes. The stars on the helmet used to have the stars on the sleeves. It got people from coast to coast. All my years living in New York with my wife, Ernestine, 2004 to 2016, how many Saturdays, how many Sundays did we walk down 8th Avenue toward Times Square? And I would turn to her and say, there's another cowboy jersey and another cowboy jersey. They're everywhere, cowboy jerseys in New York City. How did this happen? It's because they've always had such crazy star power. Even during my days of covering the Cowboys late 70s, early 80s, I used to joke that going to their practice field at lunchtime when they were available in the locker room was like going in a multiplex of theaters. You had Roger Staubach over here and Charlie Waters over here and Tutal Jones over there and Randy White and uh, Tony Dorsett. And it's just like you go watch this movie or that movie and they're all great. They're all going to be nominated for Oscars because they're all sensational interviews. That still prevails. Jerry Jones has become the most famous slash infamous owner in the history of sports, the most recognizable, even beyond George Steinbrenner with the Yankees. There's never been anything like the Dallas Cowboys. The, the narrative the love, the hate. Will they let you down? Do they always let you down when you least expect it, when, when you least can stand it? They have for 27 years. They have me. They've torn my heart out again and again and again. Will this be the year? People are on the edge of their seats. Look at the ratings every year. The top five games will feature my Dallas Cowboys. I've told you before, I went to my first game when I was 10 years old, the old Cotton Bowl in Dallas, thanks to my uncle. I went to see the Saint, then St. Louis Cardinals because that was the team we got in Oklahoma City on Sundays. It's back in the dark ages of television. You only got one game. I went to see the St. Louis Cardinals who did win the game. I think it was 34-24, but... I got stars in my eyes because of the stars on the helmet and on the shoulder pads. I got metallic blue in my blood. I got infected. And I've never been able to shake it. I learned in my early days in this business. I used to do a show in New York City called Sports Reporters for ESPN which led to doing a show called Prime Monday for ESPN up in Bristol on Monday nights for many years. But on Sundays, I would go from the taping of the sports reporters to watch the games at CBS. Terry Bradshaw was there in those days. The great Dick Shap, late great Dick Shap, a mentor of mine, would take me to CBS so we could watch all the games. Got to know some of the producers Guess what their motto was? This is back in the 90s. Their motto was, when in doubt, do cowboys. When in doubt, talk about the cowboys. So Dan from Huntington, West Virginia. Yeah, there's plenty of room on this bandwagon because it's the biggest bandwagon in the history of sports. There's never been anything like it. There's plenty of room for you. You can hop on, you can hop off, but I warn you, if you do hop on, the odds on you will get, the odds are that you'll get infected. It'll get under your skin. 
It'll seep into your heart and down into your soul. And you'll be just like I am. Hopelessly, hopelessly infected by the Dallas Cowboys. This is Carl from Queens, New York. Is this Sunday against the Jets your biggest game personally of the season? Now, obviously, we received this question from Carl before the Monday night game. I saw this question Monday during the day. Not sure exactly when it came in, but it came in obviously before. So unfortunately, Aaron Rodgers went down and out on Monday night. What a freakish play that was. I've seen a lot of Achilles injuries in my time. Seen a lot of quarterbacks suffer Achilles injuries. And almost always, it's when they're running sort of casually, like rolling out, looking to throw, and they plant to maybe cut up field. Not hard, just plant to, to move sideways. It just goes, it just goes. It's the most mysterious injury in all of sports. It's, it's the most unfair injury in all of sports. You can have micro tears in your Achilles built up over years, and you don't know that it's vulnerable. And just one wrong step, not a hard step, not a wild step, not a dangerous step, just one routine step, it goes. And once it goes, it's going to be a long, hard rehab. What a freakish play. Aaron Rodgers, I assume it came from his calf issue that he had back during OTAs. Because when you have a calf issue, it can weaken the Achilles. If you don't get it back 100% right, the Achilles can be a little weak because the calf muscles are so weak around it. I'm assuming that happened. I don't know. But obviously, it's a three-step drop pass. It's supposed to be out quickly. Dwayne Brown tries to cut block because it's, it's a quick play. Leonard Floyd, who sort of leaps over the cut block. The ball's supposed to be gone, but Aaron didn't like what he saw at a glance, and he hung on to the ball, and all of a sudden, Leonard Floyd is hanging on to him, yanking him down. His leg somewhat awkwardly gets stuck underneath him, and he's trying to push out of the sack. As he pushes forward, that's all it took. Popped. Went. Long, hard rehab. I was very, very sorry for so many friends of mine who are Jets fans. I know a bunch. I got very close back in the day with Joe Namath. You remember Joe running off the field with his forefinger in the air after one of the great upsets in the history of sports, Jets over the Baltimore Colts, who were 18 or 19 point favorites in that game, Super Bowl three. Jets from the upstart rival AFL, Joe Namath. Almost wrote a book with Joe Namath at one point. Didn't quite work out and happen. But now I look back and I think, is, is there a Joe Namath curse on the Jets? I, I don't know. It's not like they've ever done anything wrong to him. He's a great guy. Still their biggest fan, biggest ambassador. It feels like they've been cursed ever since Joe Namath broke through with that shocking upset. The one he guaranteed to writers, sort of, before the game. So I was crushed for the Jets fans. I was very sorry for Aaron Rodgers because obviously this was a big year, big deal for him. Positioned to make a big run. I thought they were going to have a hard time, but who knows? Hard knocks, the setup, it, it was the most hype any team has ever experienced heading into a season in the history of the NFL. And maybe they could have lived up to it. But now I'll just talk selfishly. Mostly I was crushed for me. I wanted Aaron Rodgers in Dallas this Sunday. 
425 Eastern. I wanted him to be the quarterback of the Jets because we were going to get our revenge on him. Aaron Rodgers is eight and two lifetime against my Cowboys. Six and two in the regular season, two and oh in the playoffs, three and oh in Dallas, three and oh at Jerry World. But it wasn't going to happen this time because we're better. We were going to get even this time. I wanted Aaron Rodgers to be there. I needed him to be there for all the suffering that he's inflicted upon us. Not, not against other teams, just mostly against us. I know he's supposed to own the Bears, but, but the Air, Bears are so ownable. We're the Dallas Cowboys. We're America's team. I'm sorry. It's not 1985 anymore. I look at the history of Aaron versus Dallas. I've told you before, he's like Dracula. He haunts us. He sucks our blood. He, he lost his first start the first year he was starting in Green Bay at home. They didn't have a very good team. We won that one 27 to 16, and then here he came. Beat us at Green Bay, beat us at Green Bay, beat us at Green Bay. Then we went up to Green Bay finally. Dak, Zeke as rookies. You'll remember that game, 30 to 16, Dak and Zeke. 2016, and yet he turned right around and got even with us yet again in that playoff game at Dallas, the Mason crossbar game, as I call it, two intergalactic field goals, both of which looked wrong off his foot, hand of God field goals that one barely fluttered, dying quail over the crossbar, the other one Looked like he duck hooked it way left of the upright, and somehow there's no wind inside Jerry World. It was just hand of God moving it back inside the left upright. I don't know how it happened. But Dak had fought back to tie the score, and then that happened. And then he comes back again the next year. Outscores us and came back again the next year. And I look up and it's 31 to 3 before we even started scoring. We cut it to 34 24. Owned us. And then, of course, last year at Green Bay, we're up 28 to 14 after three quarters. 28 to 14. Dak has the ball six more times in that game and scores zero more points. We win the toss in overtime. And we moved the ball a little bit. We had a long field goal. It was windy. It was difficult. We should have tried it, but we didn't. And the next thing I know, he's Dracula's sunk his fangs into us again, sucked our blood. Eight and two. He is lifetime against the Dallas Cowboys with 18 touchdowns to only two interceptions in those 10 games. 18 to two touchdowns to interceptions. <laughs> It's just ridiculous what he has done to us. But this year, we're better. We're better than the Jets, even with Aaron Rodgers. This year was going to be the year. That's the game I circled. And the bottom fell out when he went down and out. And my heart hit the floor. Because all of a sudden, everything changed. Now, the great irony is I'm more nervous about this game without Aaron Rodgers than I was going to be with Aaron Rodgers. I am. As God is my witness, I'm more nervous now than I would have been if Aaron Rodgers had been 1,000% healthy going into Sunday's kickoff. I'm nervous because now it's hard to get back up for a team featuring Zach Wilson, the bust, at quarterback. As I said on Undisputed, he's the classic case of the million-dollar arm and the two-cent brain. He just doesn't have the poise, the calm under fire, the command of the offense in reading defenses. He just doesn't have that. He's got an arm and he's got athletic ability, and he'll make a throw or two here or there. 
but it's hard to get back up for Zach Wilson, who struggled so mightily last year that obviously they went and got Aaron Rodgers. He's the second overall pick in the draft is Zach Wilson. Now I have to deal with a very good Jets defense, a strong Jets running game featuring Brees, as I tweeted the other night, Hall of Fame, Brees Hall of Fame, question mark, maybe. A very good offensive line. They have all the pieces except the puzzle is missing the quarterback. And now, what if we don't quite get ready for all those other pieces? The Jets are euphoric. We had Josina Anderson on the show on Undisputed the other day, and she said she was shocked in the Jets' locker room postgame Monday night. She expected some deflation, and she saw nothing but elation because somehow they fought back from 13-3 to down at half without Aaron Rodgers, with Zach Wilson, and they walked it off in overtime with a punt return for a touchdown. Euphoria, elation. Obviously, they were all crushed about Aaron, but they're 1 0 coming to Dallas. And that scares me to death. I wanted you, Aaron. And you still haunt me. This is Nikki from Oklahoma, my home state. Mike McCarthy, coach of the year? The what? Okay, Nikki, I'm going to tell you the truth. I chose this question mostly because you're from Oklahoma, as am I. But this is the most oxymoronic question I have ever been asked in my life, meaning Mike McCarthy and Coach of the Year do not belong in the same sentence because they are such contradictions. But I will give you this, Nikki, from Oklahoma. I can only hope that you're on to something because if he is the Coach of the Year, as the new play caller and still the head coach of my Dallas Cowboys, if he somehow shocks and amazes me to the point that they go 13-4, and four, as I have predicted, and they have the number one seed, yeah, Mike McCarthy would be right in line to be coach of the year. So I need this to happen. I need to, to speak of, as Aaron Rodgers says, a manifestation. I need to speak this into existence. Mike McCarthy, coach of year. Mike McCarthy, coach of year. Mike McCarthy, coach of the year. I'm speaking it. I'm putting it out into the universe so it starts to manifest. Seems pretty far-fetched to me. But if you give me two home playoff games, the second of which is the 49ers, I say Super Bowl, here we come. So Mike McCarthy, I, I always wondered, what, what does he exactly do? Now he is game planning. Now he is in-game strategizing. Now he is calling every play. There's no more Kellen Moore. Mike got rid of Kellen Moore. Mike McCarthy, coach of year. I'm putting it out there. Lincoln from Chicago asks, are you ready to change any of your predictions after week one? Lincoln. They started calling me back in my cold pizza days, never flip, skip. I never change my predictions. I, I might go down in flames. I don't change. I don't back off. It's a long season. My man Michael Irvin on his view the other day shocked me. He, he's already changed after one week his Super Bowl pick from the Cincinnati Bengals, who obviously stunk it up thanks to Joe Burrow up at Cleveland, He's changed from Cincinnati to the Dolphins because the Dolphins won the shootout of week one out here in Los Angeles at So Fine Stadium over Justin Herbert and the Chargers. So he's going to all of a sudden instead of poor Joe Burrow. How quickly Michael forgets. I don't do that. I love Michael for that. I get a great kick out of that. I do have what I call the courage of my convictions. I make my pick. I stand on my pick. I defend my pick. Till death do we part. I say Dallas, Baltimore in the Super Bowl. And right now I am picking Baltimore over Dallas in the Super Bowl because I will be a very happy man if my Cowboys 
so much as get to the Super Bowl. Baltimore over Dallas, never flip, skip. Brings me to the last question, Fred from Tampa. Is Trevon Diggs or Stephon Gilmore the jersey purchase of the season? Interesting question. I am already leaning toward number 21 because I'm starting to wonder, could this be the year of 21, as in the year of Stephon Gilmore in Dallas and the year of Deion Sanders in Colorado, who obviously wore proudly the number 21? Hmm. I said it the day the news broke. Stefan Gilmore was a steal of a deal for Jerry Jones for a mere fifth round pick. He is the missing link. He is the final piece to the defensive puzzle. He is exactly what the doctor ordered, maybe Dr. Freud, for my cowboy defense. We had a parade of nobodies at the opposite corner alongside Trevon Diggs. Trevon Diggs is the ultimate, what I call cluer, as in gambler, as in risk taker. But is he ever gifted when it comes to hawking the ball, a receiver playing cornerback? But he needed textbook opposite him. He needed trustable. He needed cornerstone. He needed Stefan Gilmore, who to me is still a top five corner, maybe playing at this stage and age more with his high football IQ than his athletic ability. But did he ever look like he could move the other night in the opener at Giants? Both he and Trevon Diggs took the game over on defense, as did Micah. But Stefan Gilmore, three pass breakups, interception. Trevon Diggs is smacking everything that moves. Wow. I have fallen in football love with Stefan Gilmore. My man Richard Sherman, excuse me, Richard Sherman knows him very well, raves about him, idolizes him, honors him at the highest level, one great cornerback to another. Jerry flat out pulled this off for a fifth round draft choice. It's the steal of the century for my Dallas Cowboys. Brandon Cooks on offense was the catalyst needed there as a deep threat. But what makes this, what, what suddenly vaults the Dallas defense over the top to being the best defense in pro football is number 21 at the opposite corner with Trevon Diggs. In fact, I just talked myself into it. I'm going home right now to order my number 21 in metallic blue. He is my new favorite player, along with Micah, obviously, I'll till death do I part be Micah, but the defense will be my offense this year. My team will go as far as this defense carries it. My defense will rise above Dak Prescott and his wildly inconsistent play. My defense now has Stefan Gilmore, and you don't. Happy Cowboys. That's it for episode 80. Thank you for listening and or watching. Thanks to Jonathan Berger and his all-pro team for making this show go. Thanks to Tyler Korn for producing. Please remember, Undisputed every weekday, 9.30 Eastern, The Skip Bayless Show, every week.